Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I, I love this story, but I, I can't really tell you why. Well, I know why I love it, but I don't know why it would be news for anybody else. I don't even think, in, under my glorious rule, this wouldn't be news. The, the notion that the colour of your skin has any reflection whatsoever on the contents of your heart or your head is, for people like me, utterly ridiculous. Now, 10,000 years ago, Britons would have been black, according to groundbreaking genome analysis. A team from London's Natural History Museum carried out DNA tests on the Stone Age Cheddar Man, Britain's oldest near-complete human skeleton. Scientists then used the data to complete a facial reconstruction, with surprising for some results, as our science editor Tom Clark reports. He was found in Goff's cave in Cheddar Gorge in Somerset in 1903. Cheddar Man has long been believed to be the oldest known complete skeleton from a time when humans came to live in Britain permanently. And it's long been assumed he's as white as Cheddar. Here's a previous reconstruction of his face. But now Cheddar Man's DNA has revealed he looked very different indeed. That's right, the first resident Britons were black with blue eyes and wavy hair. Researchers have an inkling that our ancestors were darker skinned than we were, but they had no idea that some of them could be this dark. And for those of us who identify as being white British, it's now reasonable to ask, well, what does that actually mean, given at least 10% of our ancestry is shared with this group of people? With Cheddar Man, actually, this part of the skull is still intact. What we did this part is more broken away, so we were able to go in through here. The basic spine. Yeah, yeah, and drill a very tiny hole. A documentary due to be broadcast next Sunday followed Dr Brace and colleagues at the Natural History Museum in London as they used the latest DNA techniques to obtain a sample from the bone around the inner ear of Cheddar Man's skull. They managed to extract nearly his entire genetic code and all the details that contains, like skin and eye colour. It was a surprise just how dark the pigmentation is for, for Cheddar Man. This was actually incredibly dark skinned. So it's really interesting for us as scientists to sort of be pinpointing when these kind of things happened. But what we've actually seen is that these uh, uh, um, darker pigmentations were actually surviving in these colder climes for a lot longer than we had anticipated. Probably to do with diet. Cheddar Man's ancestors left Africa about 40,000 years ago. At this time, much of northern Europe, including Britain, was being covered in ice. Around 10,000 years ago, the ice retreated, but what we now call Britain was connected to the continent by a land bridge called Doggerland. It was across that that Cheddar Man's ancestors colonised Britain. There's been people here ever since. We now know Cheddar Man belonged to a group called the Western Hunter Gatherers, who arrived here before Neolithic people brought farming to Britain about 6,000 years ago. One, two, three. The new data allowed Dutch twins Ari and Alphonse Kennis to reconstruct Cheddar Man's face. Years ago we made reconstruction, we know nothing about sk uh, of skin colour and things, but now with this new DNA evidence, eye colour, skin colour, hair colour, we get some extra evidence how it would look like. And it's amazingly prominent skin colour, hair colour, hairstyle. For the scientists, the trove of information in Cheddar Man's DNA makes the colour of his skin kind of superficial. It can tell us about their lifestyle as well. It can tell us that they do not have the genes that allow you to process drinking milk. They also probably uh, wouldn't have been, well, Cheddar Man probably wouldn't have been able to tolerate any kind of alcohol. Uh, so we can tell all sorts of things about lifestyle as well. The researchers are now extracting DNA from hundreds of human remains from before and after Cheddar Man's death 10,000 years ago. They hope to construct the most complete picture yet of our recent ancestors. And for people who think it does matter, um, who obviously exist, otherwise the word racism wouldn't have been introduced to the, to the English vocabulary, um, they, they, what happens to them? So I can't, there's no way I'm going to be able to talk for 45 minutes on this issue saying give me a ring if you're a real racist and tell me how you feel about the fact that your ancestors turned out to be black. 
0345 973 A couple of stories, um, I think from Germany recently, about one far-right politician discovering that he had Jewish heritage and it turned his anti-Semitic worldview entirely on his head. This isn't going to be the same, because this is like your great, 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 no one's counting, are they? Great, 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 great grandfather, um, as opposed to your grandfather. If you found out your grandfather was of a, a profoundly different ethnicity to you, um, or to what you thought you were, that could have an impact. I read a book as a kid about someone in apartheid era South Africa who was a, a, an albino, and the lengths that they went to, to uh, because the quality of life you could expect if everybody else thought you were white was so incredibly superior to the quality of life you could expect under apartheid if everybody thought you were black. Um, but it's one of those stories I read as a youngster. I didn't even really know what apartheid was. Uh, it just stuck in my brain for some reason. If anyone else has read it and they can remember what it was called, um, I'd love a, I'd love a little reminder. I'd put it up with, with that book, Zed for Zachariah, about the aftermath of a nuclear war. Books that you read on the cusp of adulthood, you know, in, in, in kind of early teens, early to mid-teens, when you weren't reading Swords and Sorcery and stuff anymore, but you weren't ready for, for your Dickens and your, and your Balzacs. But they were, it's called YA fiction now, isn't it? It's even a genre, but it wasn't a genre when I was a young adult. It was, it was just, just luck that you stumbled across these books. I remember Zed for Zachariah, because I'm pretty sure it was written by a bloke called O'Brien. Um, and also, there was supposed to be a film of that. I, I digress slightly. But I read a book in which it, it was really, really... So I can understand in a racist society why it matters what colour your skin is. Nothing matters more. The more racist a society is, the more the colour of your skin impacts upon your quality of life. So under apartheid, colour of skin is huge. I find it tragic in a way that this is newsworthy because in an ideal universe we wouldn't even reflect upon the colour of people's skin as having any impact upon their right to be anywhere. A human, humankind, humanity itself... Um, was born in, in Africa. Every human being on the planet has, if you trace their history back far enough, has roots on the African continent, and those roots would be, in human form, black. It's not controversial, although presumably it, it makes some people's tiny little brains explode. This story is, is just really interesting. About 11,700 years ago, Cheddar Man's people are thought to have come to Britain, coming across the land bridge that once connected the country to continental Europe. Keep that one quiet, seriously. You can, you can hear Brexit brains um, blowing up from here. Used to, well, they, what, we used to be joined by land? It's called Doggerland. Um, I presume that's got something to do with Tyne and Dogger, has it, in the, in the shipping forecast? I'm not sure. But... It has emerged uh, after DNA tests upon this skeleton found about 100 years ago in a cave at Cheddar Gorge. If you've never been to Cheddar Gorge, you should check it out. It's amazing. Loads of places in England, you know, that, that we don't properly recognise as being incredible because we've kind of bought into the idea post-package holidays, I guess, post-jet post jet holidays. We've bought into the idea that you have to go overseas to see really amazing stuff. You don't. There's some amazing things in it. We'll do a show about it one day, just when I've got my Auntie Alan Partridge guard on. There's a slight danger of falling into Partridge territory completely when I start waxing lyrical about English tourist attractions. But this, this was found about 100 years ago. Um, they've done DNA analysis of his 9,000-year-old bones. There are days when I feel like I've got 9,000-year-old bones. But they've done DNA analysis of them, and it's pretty clear that he was dark to black skin. Um, blue eyes, gently curled black hair, wide cheekbones, and a delicate chin. It's um, a combination of features, according to Ian Barnes uh, at the Natural History Museum. He's a, uh, an expert in ancient DNA. Doesn't look like anyone that you'd see today. But the presumption was always that... that that our ancestors and these islands in Northern Europe would be white. So what question am I going to ask you? Because this to me seems to be actually part of the problem rather than the solution. I, 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 I mean, in terms of my worldview, which is that the sooner we can stop seeing external colours and focus on internal qualities, the better for all concerned. I've told you quite a few times that if I ever do take over the universe, the first thing I'm going to do is order DNA tests for everybody because the notion that you have some sort of ancient fealty to a bloodline is bonkers. It's palpably absurd. And if you do, the chances are 
that you haven't developed in an evolutionary sense as much as you could have done because one of the primary prerequisites for a healthy gene pool is diversity. The more diverse your gene pool is, the more likely you are to move on to the next stage of evolution. We're covering a lot of ground here, aren't we? Do you know why? Because I still can't think of a question to ask you. If you can think of your own question and you want to answer it before I've even asked it, ring me now on 0345 6060. 973. Um, I guess my favourite response when I mentioned this story earlier was from a very angry person um, insisting that only 10% of our genetic ancestry comes from the West European hunter-gatherer population, so you can't read too much into this. Obviously desperate, desperate to cling to the idea that, that, that somehow there are two branches of the human family tree, one of which is white and one of which is black. Eventually there will be, but to begin with it was all black. The received wisdom prior to this astonishing breakthrough was that our skin tones essentially lightened as we spent less time in the sun. Um, the pigments would persist in some southern European populations, uh, but genes linked to lighter skin spreading only about seven to 8,000 years ago. This is solid DNA evidence of the skin tone of these first Britons, and they were black. Do you know what I want to ask you? I'd like to ask you, so what? If you are of colour, does this... What's the word? Does it please you, actually? Let's not overthink it or overcomplicate it. It, it actually proves what, what we've known all along, which is that these notions of, of skin-based hierarchies are evil and wrong. 0345 I think, yeah, can I do an hour on so what? Or is that going to be really amateurish? What does it mean to you? 0345 is the number that you need. You can email and text and tweet, but I'm much more interested in talking to you. Does it change the way you look at the world in any way? I mean, what does it mean to you as a white person to discover that your ancestors were black? Again, again, that's going to depend upon how important you think skin colour is. And you are historically, I think it's fair to say, less likely to ring me these days if you are an out-and-out -out racist than you might have done a few years ago. 0345 if, if you want to, if you believe in white supremacy in any way, shape or form, either as a kind of entry level Donald Trump flavoured version of it or as a full on Nazi. How do you process this information? Now, I am pretty close to saying ring me now if you're a Nazi. 0345 973 um, These are the comments I really like from the director of the documentary that goes out on Channel 4 on Sunday night. Not, not for a while, February the 18th. He thinks that the genome sequencing, uh, which is what they've done, could inform modern discussions about race and even Brexit. Stephen Clark says, you go back quite far and discover that everything's in flux. Everything changes. That's the message of the film. There is a national debate and a debate about our relationship with Europe. All of those things are still in the mix. It speaks to us now. Why? Well, because Cheddar Man is essentially a European as opposed to a Brit. It's about migration, it's about the movement of, of people, and then it's about the gradual lightening of skin over millennia until we are where we are today. Hit the numbers now, you, you probably get through. It's coming up to 12.15. We've got PMQs at 12.45, so we're not going to have ages to dive into this story. And, and I, I guess I'm asking you to be my therapist again, because I think it's really, really interesting. But I also think it's really, really obvious. It's, it's, it's just a geographical surprise. It's a, it's, a, it's a surprise of timing and place. It's not a surprise of origin and humanity. It's a circumstantial surprise, if you will, rather than a, an existential one. And yet, I can't really explain to you why I, why I find this story so fascinating, which is why I'm asking you to tell me why you like this story so much. 0345 973 is the number that you need. It's also been established that the Cheddar Man is genetically similar to other Mesolithic skeletons found in Spain, Hungary and Luxembourg. So that's where they claim that he's more of a European than a Brit comes from. Subsequent to that claim, I suppose, is, is the notion that there's no such thing historically. If you take a broad enough sweep of history, there's no such thing as British. There's just different gradations of descent from these black ancestors. I'm, I'm just looking at the male's hatchet job on Anna Subri today and I mean to be fair they have got a bang to write. Some of the stuff they've unearthed from her past is, is, is deeply shaming. Try this for example. Actually it begins with the 
phrase, for example, after she was one of a minority of Tories to rebel and inflict defeat on the government's Brexit bill in December, Ms Subri was spotted drinking wine in a Commons bar, toasting victory. This woman drinks wine. How can we have her even close to the mother of all parliaments? Uh, Ms Subri was brought up in Worksop. Her mother was an NHS radiographer, while her father was a garage owner. Stoned them. Seriously. Stone the traitors. And uh, finally, video was unearthed of her back in the 1990s, complete with big hair and brash jewellery. Take her appearance on the quiz programme, Celebrity Squares. Presenter Bob Monkhouse saucily said to her, We all know you from this morning. I wish I knew you from last night. Miss Subri tried to laugh off the innuendo. I'm changing my view of this woman. I genuinely think that she is an enemy of the people. Because that, that evidence there, accumulated by the, uh, by the Daily Mail, is damning. Certainly is damning. Although, of course, it's also a day on which they celebrate Theresa May's claim that um, she wants to clamp down on, on abuse and intimidation. Which is remarkable, really, when you reflect that Darren Osborne, the convicted terrorist murderer, uh, was found to have left a note in his van after driving it into a crowd of innocent worshippers outside a mosque in Finsbury Park that contained three names. And those three names were Jeremy Corbyn, Sadiq Khan and Lily Allen. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were to speculate upon which corners of this country might have led an impressionable, vulnerable, ultimately murderous man like Darren Osborne to conclude that Jeremy Corbyn... Sadiq Khan and Lily Allen were worthy targets of his fury. I wonder where we'd go if we were asking who radicalised him. Where, can you think of anyone or anywhere that has kind of piled in on the uh, pop star Lily Allen when attempting to discuss politics? Uh, can you think of any corners of the British media that have attempted to portray Sadiq Khan or Jeremy Corbyn in incredibly negative ways? Hmm. No, me neither. But, of course, when Jacob Rees-Mogg's fanboy, who likes dressing up as a member of the Waffen-SS, takes a swing, apparently, in self-defence at a woman at a meeting at Bristol University, Theresa May suddenly decides we need new laws. So, just to recap, the right-wing media can demonise an utterly blameless individual who makes her living as a pop star like Lily Allen to such a degree that a murderous terrorist has her name on a note left in his van when he's driven it into a crowd of innocent worshippers. Not even a whisper from Downing Street. Add in to that list Jeremy Corbyn and Sadiq Khan. No, 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 nothing there about intimidation, about radicalisation, about hate preaching. Jacob Rees-Mogg's fanboy who likes dressing up as a Nazi hits a woman in Bristol and she announces the need for new laws. You could be forgiven for thinking this morning that you'd gone completely mad, but trust me, you haven't. Now, back to race and Cheddar Man. Jordan is in Harlow. Jordan, what do you want to say? Oh, Mr O'Brien, it's a pleasure to speak to you, sir. Well, it's very kind of you to say so. Let's hope that, let's hope that, let, that impression sustains. <laughs> Love the morning bit as well. Uh, about the Tesco's, I'm a Tesco delivery driver as well. There you go. A job. Yes. Where do you stand on it? Where do I stand on it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's keep that one for another time. Are you sure? It's 6-4. Yeah, we, we could smuggle in two more votes on Tesco's while discussing the origin of man. It, I mean, not I only would it... I can't afford not to get a one-up on the pickers. Basically, um, when you work in the back room, because we, we can't work in... All just just for anyone out. who's just tuned in, Jordan has rung in to discuss the origin of Britain, eth ethnically <laughs> speaking, as discovered by the DNA analysis of an 11,000-year-old skeleton. But he's just going to fill us in on Tesco. Just quickly, in there for anyone who wants to know about the backstory of yes. Tesco's. Uh, so you've got two sections of dot .com, which are basically the delivery delivery driving. So you've got the, the dot .com section of the delivery, and then you've got the pickers. Uh, in the warehouse, you basically have people moving stuff all the time from either outsourced deliveries or you have just the drivers in general moving stuff. Now, it's, in reality, everyone in the store works hard. Yes. And that's just the fact. Yeah, yes. Everyone works hard. Yeah, you have to. You get, you, get your, you get your backside kicked if you don't. Exactly. You've got managers, you've got security cameras, you can't oh. take a moment off. No. But in terms of what the actual job consists of, yes. from time to time, the job itself is going to be more difficult than other bits. Because my job, for instance, right now I've got a customer who lives in a third floor flat, no lift, they've got eight ambient trays, four chill trays, two frozen trays. I'm going to get that up there at one o'clock. Having a laugh. Exactly, and that, compare that to someone who's sitting on tills at the moment, who is... I'm with you, 6-5. You know, 
Six five. It's a late flurry. It's a late flurry for the pickers and the warehouse workers and the drivers. In fact, the drivers are a whole new tribe in this conversation. Do you ever? I have to say the point, their job isn't as important as my job because they are. We're both a, fra a face of the company. The first thing the customers see, they don't see the managers or the warehouse. They see the products and very true the employees. It's just a difficult one, really. Yeah. Everyone has their own personal view on what's difficult and what's not. It's all subjective. You're, no, you're quite, let's move on to something simpler. What, what did you ring in no to way. tell me about the origin of British ethnicity turning out oh, to be black? I love, I love the Cheddar Man. I love him. Because <laughs> I've always despised the notion of... I don't want to say race wars, but we have, throughout human history, been locked in a race war, religious wars, monetary conflict wars. It's just conflict throughout human history. I think it's a very much... A, sh a sort of natural human disaster that we have somehow separated ourselves through th the amount of pigmentation in our skin due to the geolocation of where our mothers decided to yeah. give birth to us in equation to the uh, in uh, location to the equator, as you said, pigmentation obviously is depending on how much sun you are needed to absorb. Obviously, if you have darker skin, it's because you live in a more Mediterranean or tropical area where you receive more sun, so you need darker skin to reflect more sun, so you don't inherit more skin cancer, etc. At the end of the day... You put it, you put it, you put it like that, and one wonders why Enoch Powell's name is still spoken in hushed tones in certain corners oh, of this country. <laughs> <laughs> I just find it funny how people like you, like you said earlier, I don't want to say right-wing, but people who are racist will find information like this and would either deny it, <laughs> which is obviously most people love... All people want is fact. They want scientific fact that they can say, OK, that is yes. real, that is undisputably inarguable with. But when you have, when it comes to things like race, people just have this notion where there's, there's been so much divide and separation. Even when it comes to things like Cheddar Man, yes, people will still sit there and actively deny. It's heartbreaking. We aren't all one race. It's heartbreaking. We are one species. It's, it's pointless and species. stupid and wrong, but years yeah. we've lost. But it never goes away. It comes back up. You think you might have oh. tamped it down for a generation or two. You think that things like the Holocaust might have made us all come hey, to our hey, collective hey. senses. I know. It's, it's, it's disheartening because. I was thinking about how much we could have achieved, because I only see myself as sitting on a political spectrum, because sure. my view is, is that, like I said, we're one race, we're one species, I don't care. When you, <laughs> when you see dolphins out in the wild from different regions all over the world, they don't speak the same language, because we don't understand that they do speak a language. They don't speak the same language. When they find a massive shoal of fish, and they all come together, they don't speak the same, they're not from the same area, they don't fight each other. They work together to reap the rewards of their natural environment and resources. What we do we like instead dolphins, is create, yes. we, literally, it's the easiest way to put it. You know, we are mammals, you know, there's similarities. I hear you. Do you think this will make the blindest bit of difference to anybody or anything, though? No, no, Oh, no, come no, no. on. This is, this is thousands of years of systemic and ingrained hatred and divide through... All it does uh, is remind us that it's... Genders. It just reminds us that it's built on nonsense. But, of course, the more you want to believe it, the more you will put effort into somehow convincing yourself that it's not nonsense. Um, Jordan, thank you. No problem. Um, before you go, can I ask you a slightly personal question? Yeah. How often do you get a cash tip? Do you know what? I can honestly make my hourly wage in a day through tips. I never ask for wage. Whenever a customer says to me, or goes to give me a pound or, or some yeah. change, I say, no, don't, don't be silly, honestly. Just don't worry about it. Really? Yeah, honestly. But Why? They, st they still love to do it because oh, good. I don't... I have an hourly wage, you know. I don't need to be tipped. I, I greatly appreciate it. It gets my coffee. <laughs> but, so, how, how, I mean, out of ten customers, how many would offer you a quid or two? Do you know what's funny? I work in uh, Borehamwood, Radley, yeah. and Northern. Yeah. And it, I work in millionaire lanes, and I deliver to council estates. And the people more likely to give me a tip are the people working in the council estates. Yeah, that tallies. I, I mean, the, 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 the... And that's not to say that, I, I, like I said, I don't expect anything but when you ask me out of 10 it's yeah. that's a quite of a vague question to ask because it's not no, all right all right the, flipping uh, heck stephen hawking <laughs> i'm sorry that the, the, oh, the details of the question i'm just trying to simplify things a bit <laughs> give me a rough answer regards i like of an average out of 10 how many i'd say at least three or four okay i'm going to start again i stopped because I, I, someone explained to me that it was offensive but it's not offensive at all you can always just refuse to take it but sometimes I have an I have an old lady who lives in uh, Boreham Wood. I deliver to on a regular. 
And she literally, when I give her a receipt, she'll automatically slip it into my hand slyly as if I was a grandchild. Oh, that's uh, lovely. She hasn't seen in weeks. And oh, that's I love lovely. It. But it's customers like that that make the job worth doing. Of course it is. Of course yeah, it you know? is. I'll, I'll tell you what, I bet you make her delivery worth delivering as well with your... With your... Um, your charm. Uh, it's coming up to 12.29. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Should we squeeze in, Ray, before the news? I think we should, because um, we've got PMQs coming up at 12.45. Ray, is this going to change your world view? No, not at all. Why is that, Ray? Well, I've seen the picture in the paper, the blue eyes. Now, it doesn't look African. And when you said that we all come from Africa, did we? Yes, Ray. Are you sure? Because the continents were different. Africa didn't exist back in the day, did it? <laughs> so, you, 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 did Britain, no, 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 did Britain exist back in the day? Any names you give to that part of the world? Yes, but the part of the world we now call Africa is the part of the mm. world whence all humanity derives. <sighs> that's, that's debatable sometimes. Yeah, but listen, I've seen the picture. Just give me a quick, give, give me a nod towards where the other side of the debate is, because I've got one hundred percent of 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 science on this side. What's on your side? Mm, well, science has been proved wrong so many times. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Well, give me a favourite example of science being proved wrong. Oh, let's have a quick think now. Egyptians? And on, on, their, on what they did and what they didn't do? And, so, so um, Isaac, how has science been proved wrong? And you said, just so we're clear, because I don't want you to feel that you've been unfairly treated, you said Egypt, oh, no, no, I wouldn't be unfair, I just, Egyptians, you know, I what, what they've done and what they haven't done. Well, that, that's how, science how, being how proved wrong. wrong. How They're being proved now that... that, that Every, everything they existed or whatever they had wasn't theirs, wasn't it? It was before them. They took it over from somebody else. Well, how is that science, Ray? It sounds like history to me. Well, well that science proves, proves different things. You know, science would say this happened here, that happened there, and, and the Egyptians say, no, it's ours, but it's getting proven different all the time. Science you know, says different, different things. Let's, let's, this happened here, this happened there, but science yeah. says, oh, it's ours, it's a different thing. No, the, Egyp the Egyptians would turn around and say, the, the, oh, this, 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 we, we did this, we didn't. It's been proven many times, and they didn't. Right. Like they did, um, in, the, in, the, in the large pyramid, they found another chamber. But um, How is that science? Well, you need science and, and things to do with science to prove so, these things. But what was the science that got disproved? Uh, the... Yeah, I, got, I was reading about the other afternoon. You have to excuse me because I've been having chemotherapy. My, my short-term memory is absolutely shot. Okay. It was about. It was about. Um, they found a grand chamber, another chamber up in the pyramids, and the, the scientific team that were doing it put, put three tests up under the pyramids and discovered this this uh, room. But the Egyptians were were saying no, it doesn't exist, doesn't exist. But they proved it right. Okay. They proved it this way. I, I didn't. Exist. I didn't. I, if you've been a bit poorly, then I shall. I shall leave it there, right? And wish you a no, speedy. No, no, and, no, and wish you a no, speedy recovery. No. I you're don't, fine. Okay. You're well. fine. But what I'm on about with this this, this picture today, I agree that we we're probably all one colour at one time, and racism is a, a more modern thing than it, than it has been in the past. Say the last 400 years, I think racism might have been around, but I don't think back to the Mate, the, the, the the, the, go back to your really beloved good. Egypt and count the slaves. Um, the twelve thirty one is the time. Uh, Ray, I do wish you a speedy recovery, my friend. I truly do. I, I suppose the question that we should have been asking, although I've enjoyed the answers that we've got to whatever question it is we did ask, would be given that this is so obviously self evident. All of us come from the same roots, human, humani hu humanly speaking. Um, therefore, it shouldn't be that massive a shock to discover that the first known human resident, early human resident of these islands actually had black skin. Um, why, why, why are we all still so racist? Would have been the question perhaps to ask. 12.37 is the time. Alec is in Worcester. Alec, what would you like? Well, you don't shop in River Island, do you, on a regular basis when you're in Worcester? Funny that, actually, you were saying it and my ears pricked up. I was like, oh, man, I might have been there at the time. But no, <laughs> Still there, isn't it? Near, near the stairs, just on the way up, on the left, yeah, as you come up from Fourgate Street. There. Anyway, we digress. As, uh, hopefully there isn't still an igloo made out of shoeboxes in the stockroom. Or some, some sweaty student sleeping inside. What did you ring to tell me about Cheddar Man? I, I uh, just thought that I get a natural scientist perspective, maybe that's where it's the last caller. Yes. But um, I, so I'm a molecular biologist at the moment, I do my master's. And I've got to say that not not surprised at all no. by uh, what's happened. I mean, I've, there are a few studies that have been done, for example, by Witherspoon in America. It's published in the American Journal of Genetics. And they looked at the genetic differences within the so-called races as opposed to between them. Yes. And they found out that the genetic variety, uh, variety within each race is actually greater than it is between any one, any two races. And so, therefore, as Gosh. an idea, they don't actually exist. So, for example, two people from the Middle East or from the Oriental can have just as great a differences in their genome as 
somebody from America and somebody from uh, China. It's amazing, isn't it? It's, um, it, it is. And I presume molecular biology makes it utterly unsurprising, whereas most of us don't have that grounding to, to, to see it as a, the inevitable upshot of shared origins. I mean, the, the diversity of any DNA in any human being across the globe is going to reflect the, the millennia of migration and breeding. Completely, yeah. I mean, skin colour, for example, is a continuous trait. So it's not like where you have eye colour or, you know, um, your... Uh, the eye colour, for example, is obviously that's a defined colour, whereas with your skin colour, it's continuous. So yeah. it's completely a reflection of uh, primarily... Circumstance. Environment, also Environmental yeah. circumstance. Yeah. I like it. So this story won't change anything because you, 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 you will have science on one side, um, uh, and uh, it, it, science is, of course, the best available explanation for, for the available evidence. And if the evidence changes, then science accommodates the new changes. But as things stand, there, there's no prospect of DNA analysis being superseded by some other way of um, analysing human origin. So you've got science on one side, and then on the other side, you've got people who need to believe that skin yeah. colour is an indicator of something deeper I, I and more think... profound. And science never really changes their view. I think the argument you might see, of course, is that lots of people believe that um, evolution is linear, uh, where you get, obviously, you get either increased complexity or you get improvements, and that just isn't true. Things obviously just spread out to fill new environments as they occur. But I think what you might see now is people going, oh, well, uh, this man with brown skin was around 7,000, 8,000 years ago, and so we as modern Britons have, are more evolved than he is. We've evolved, and we are now more evolved with our white skin. Well, we except that everybody else has evolved. As, uh, whatever your skin colour is, you've evolved over that same period of millennia as well. You've just ended up a yeah, different colour yeah. at the end of it from the same root. 100%, I agree, yeah. What's the big news in molecular biology this week, Alec? Uh, this week, uh, see, uh, unfortunately for me, I'm, I'm in the world of plant science. <laughs> are you... So where are you born? Where, when did you study near Worcester then? Uh, I studied at the University of Birmingham. I was going to say, I, I couldn't think where, what educational establishment in Worcester itself, but you're just, just an hour from Birmingham. 12.41, good luck. Paul is in Worcester Park, not Worcester. Um, well, I didn't need to say that. I don't know why I did. Paul, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. Hello, mate. I often hear you um, quite correctly say... That's the that, thing um, about radios. <laughs> yeah, I often hear you quite saying that, uh, you know, the colour of a skin doesn't matter and is irrelevant, okay, which I agree. To the value so, of a where, human being. So where's the story? Well, where is the story that you've decided to, like, run? <laughs> well, it's a question based upon the existence of people who think that the colour of skin does matter and, and asking, essentially, how on earth they can continue thinking that when they've been shown scientifically that it clearly doesn't. I apologise. I thought that was really obvious. No, no, it's not. It's not. It may be obvious to uh, to you, but I'm not, not sure if it is obvious. I, I still don't see how you can justify where the story well, is. Here's the sense. thing: not skin everybody not everybody agrees with me that skin colour is irrelevant. You, you you're aware of that, right? But how does it change it? You bring in you you mentioning this <laughs> because if. We accept the existence of people that think your skin colour is an indicator of your value as a human being. You're familiar with things like racism and apartheid and discrimination. So those people who think that skin colour really does matter, when you present them with scientific evidence that it really, really doesn't, the question I would like people to answer is how does that affect your world view? But, but people aren't really keen to ring me up and say, I'm a massive racist and this is how it affects my world view. No, but often those people say those things because they think there is a difference, true, between, between the races. Between, well, they think there might be a difference of what's going on under the skin that is somehow indicated by the colour of the skin, but this story well, renders hang on, that... Hang on. Well, when we say going, going under, that's a strange term. They, these people say there's a difference. Now, these archaeologists, all they've dug up... Are you, are you tired or something? Am I, am I taxing you a bit here? Um, I don't know that I'm tired. I, I just, I've answered no, your question. Just tax. Well, I, try, I, try, and, try and follow it. I've all answered your question, done, Paul. Hang on, they, they've dug up skin and bone. Just skin no, they haven't, they haven't dug up yet. any skin, Paul. It was 11,000 okay, years old. OK, all right, well, that, that actually improves my argument. The older it is, <laughs> the from what they've found, yes. they're unable to find that it's probably a black skin covering it rather than a white one, in which case there must be a difference. There is a difference, isn't there? Between what, Paul? 
ball between a skeleton from which they can like draw the conclusion that it was a black guy and a skeleton from which they can draw the conclusion it's a white guy. There's a difference so, in the colour of their skin, but nothing else, Paul. That's what the DNA analysis establishes. And if if you go back far and Paul, just in a sentence, because obviously I don't think we're going to part as bosom buddies. But in a sentence, tell me why you care about this story enough to ring me. Um, I actually do actually like racial harmony. I think it's people like you who bring up stories like this continually actually um, emphasise the difference rather than trying to harmonise it. This, this story is all about being identical, and it's not me bringing it up, is it? It's, it's a well, documentary no, you, you, you on Channel 4 on February the 18th. It's on page you 3 of the Times. Up. It's on the National News Bulletin, yeah, and we've been, have, we've been we're running it. Because I'm, I'm really interested, Paul, in people who think that skin colour is an indicator of something other than skin colour, and we all know that there are lots of them in the world, Paul. There are lots and lots of them in the world, and I wonder how they process this information. James, somewhere in the world, Mickey Mouse is wearing a James O'Brien watch. You do realise that? I did, you know, it's not often I get owned so comprehensively as I just have been by you, Paul. I, I shall send you a badge in the post. It is 12.49, according to my Mickey Mouse watch. Theo Ashwood is here to talk us through events at PMQs earlier this afternoon. Let's start with uh, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, brief exchanges with Theresa May. Today he went on police funding uh, and rising crime because, of course, later on MPs are going to be voting on the National Police Grant in real terms. It amounts to a cut just shy of £120 million in the next financial year. It's not going to be uh, a headline dominator, and that's why Jeremy Corbyn decided to bring it up at PMQs. The Speaker, recorded crime is up by one-fifth since 2010. Violent crime up by 20%. And during the period the Prime Minister was Home Secretary, £2.3 billion was cut from police budgets. Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary warns neighbourhood policing risks being eroded and the shortage of detectives is at a national crisis. Does the Prime Minister think the Inspectorate is scaremongering? Yeah, exactly. James, I think there might have been a rude sound um, when um, just before I played that clip. But it wasn't spoil the magic. It, it was your, no, it no was headphones. Case. They probably didn't hear anything. Stop Sorry. it! Now people are going to wonder what they've missed. Uh, Mr. Corbyn was, of course, referring there to a report carried out last March by uh, Zoe, Bill Zoe Billingham for the Inspectorate, which monitors, of course, police forces across the country. Theresa May, though, uh, she had a useful quote of her own. Uh, this one from Tony Lloyd, the Labour Police and Crime Commissioner in Greater Manchester. The, the Right Honourable Gentleman mentions the issue about recorded crime. One of the challenges that we have seen in police in recent years is ensuring that we get proper recording of particularly of certain types of crime. And I'm pleased to say that we have seen improvements over the last seven to eight years in the recording by police of, uh, of certain types of crime. Now, he also talks about the uh, issue of police budgets. As I've said, this is a government that is actually protecting police budgets. And I might, I might remind the right honourable gentleman that the Labour Party's former Shadow Home Secretary, now the Police and Crime Commissioner for Greater Manchester, himself said that the police could take an up to 10% cut in their budgets. James, can we do some Brexit details? Some really I don't like fun. talking about Brexit. Come on. Fine. I'd love to find another presenter. It's, it's, I just, it's not really my thing. It's not your bag. No. So put some really fine detail, because you're into fine detail. I like a bit of fine you detail. Fine detail. I do. So, Article 50, yes. that was what we came up with, the divorce, the divorce bill, EU citizens' rights, Northern Ireland, Ireland border, and that was agreed in December. That, that we'd have reached an agreement on these three things before we can move on to phase two, and the claim, it's not Article 50, I mean, under the terms yes, of Article exactly. 50. And, yes. and, and in December, although you and I thought it might be a bit of a fudge, they appeared to have reached an agreement on those three issues. Exactly. And then when Michel Barnier came over and met David Davis, yes. he talked about... Don't say Michel, say Michelle. Otherwise Michel. I keep thinking of Susan Tully and EastEnders. <laughs> okay. Michel. Yeah. When he came over and he sat down with David Davis, he talked about, you know, Theresa May, time to make up her mind. But he also said something quite interesting. And it was this, that one of the priorities for the European Commission was to put that agreement into a legally binding document. He wanted it yes. signed and sealed. Which is not unreasonable. He's effectively... I mean, so it's that a we little can't bit go unflattering... Back because he's just saying, all right, that's fine, but I'm not taking your word for it. I would like it written down in black and the old white. Exactly. And the phrase you keep on hearing from the government is, uh, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. But, yes. of course, if you agree the divorce bill under Article 50 in Northern Ireland and EU citizens' it rights, agreed. it is separate yes. to the trade deal. And, of course, Theresa May is trying to say, well, nothing, everything is contingent on us getting a good trade deal. Mm. Now, Chris Philp is a member of the Treasury Select Committee. He's an uber-loyalist to uh, Theresa May's government, but even he now is having concerns about it. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recent reports have suggested that the European Commission is asking that we enter into certain limited legally binding agreements in relation to bits of our exit in isolation. Could the Prime Minister confirm that it remains the government's policy that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed and therefore we'll only enter into a legally binding agreement in relation to the entire exit agreement and not just parts of it? Words are really, really important here. And I want you to listen detail. Yes. Now, this is really important because Theresa May's reply gives her a get out. There are the, the negotiations that are now taking place are, first of all, to put uh, greater detail into the definition of the implementation period, and we expect to do that by the March European Council. But alongside that, there is the looking at the legal basis of the withdrawal agreement, which, of course, will have to come to this Parliament for agreement as the, with both of those, as the withdrawal uh, agreement and implementation bill in due course. At that stage, uh, I would expect to have the future relationship set out in a way so that people are able to look at the whole package when they come to make that decision. Oh, okay, so yeah. you've got the withdrawal bill. That's going to come to the Parliament. We need that. Impl yes, implementation. That's going to come and MPs are going to get a say on that. Mm. But her words, she says the future relationship is going to be set out. It's not going to be defined. It's not going to necessarily give MPs... MPs are not necessarily going to have a say on the final deal. It's merely going to be set out. And that, of course, gives the European Commission complete control. And, of course, because we would have already agreed the divorce bill, which is going to stand somewhere between 35 and £39 billion, pounds, it isn't going to be contingent on getting that free trade deal. The two things are separate. There is a gap. But why do you and we're surprised? going to fall down the middle well, of it. Are you just doing that for theatrical effect? Because this was... Bleed and obvious from the very beginning, wasn't it? But it's always been... What you're suggesting is that finally been... reality is biting exactly. in Parliament and not just unfolding on, on little listened-to radio programmes who've been sharing the incontrovertible facts for the last 19 months. And, and that Theresa May, in her answer, her very carefully worded answer to Chris Philp, is conceding that point, yes. that there is this gap and that it isn't the future relationship, that trade deal isn't going to be set up because, of course, the European Union who has always said... The European Union doesn't do trade deals with anybody who is inside the bloc. It no, only does trade deals can't. with third parties. That's the whole point of it. So we're back to the eternal Brexit question, which is, was it incompetence or dishonesty? When this latest slogan, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, replaced Brexit means Brexit or red, white and blue Brexit, were they just kicking the can down the road in the hope that something would turn up to somehow deny the reality that was inevitable eventually? Or well, that nobody would notice. Yeah. Nobody would notice. But, but I'm trying to make sure that you... Well, you do notice, of course. I, you know, I, I notice. And your listeners notice. But I just wanted to get that point, no, because I think because that is important. people in the House of Commons that, are, that still don't understand. Bernard Jenkin was interviewed earlier today talking about the EU would never impose tariffs upon us. Under the World Trade Organization's most favoured nation rules, they would have no choice. If, if there is no deal, then it is the, the World Trade Organization's most incontrovertible of regulations that no country can be treated differently from others. And given that the European Union has tariffs in place for countries that aren't in the EEA, EFTA or the EU or, or the Customs yeah. Union or the single market, then the WTO rules under which they keep insisting that we'd be fine categorically insist that tariffs are put in place and yet he's on the BBC largely unchallenged in his ignorance because increasingly I wonder whether the journalists now are just as ignorant as some of the politicians. I thought you didn't do Brexit. I thought you just, I just didn't think. Look, anyway, let's, let's move on from Brexit. But there is one, sometimes, James, yes. a backbench MP really lands a punch right smack on the Prime Minister's nose. Uh, and Did this he time, say, who's the MP? It was a she, Thelma, Thelma Walker. Did she say, Mrs May, somewhere there is a Mickey Mouse wearing a Theresa May watch? No. Oh. Which of the following things would the Prime Minister recommend they cut next? Care for an older person with dementia, emptying the bins, providing hot school meals for vulnerable children, libraries, leisure centres or museums, or supporting the 24% of children living in poverty? Your choice, Prime Minister. I would have thought that the Honourable Lady should have been welcoming the improvements that have taken place in her constituency, should have welcomed the many more children who are in good or outstanding schools as a result of this government, should have welcomed the extra health funding, should have welcomed the more people who... Oh, no, the Prime Minister is in the middle of giving her answer. 
Theresa May didn't get back up after no. John Burko uh, intervened to finish her answer. I just picked that one out because it was a, it was a, it was a moment in the House of Commons earlier. Indeed, it was. Um, coming up to twelve fifty, we've got a minute left. Anything else on your mind? Do you want any advice about anything? No. You sure? Yeah. yeah. What, what advice can you give, James? I don't know. I just was wondering. So I've, I've misjudged it. I did see when it got to ten t. I thought, oh my goodness, are these quotes going to last? But no, no, no. Here well, I, I like it. I like it. I try to keep it short and sweet. So really. watch this space. And what about this speech Boris Johnson's going to give on Valentine's Day? What can you tell us about that? Well, it depends at what mood Boris Johnson is. I think he's written two. He might, he might, he could have written three or four. And then, you know, wake up on Valentine's Day, depends whether, you know, there's somebody left a rose on his pillow and, and he'll, um, and he'll answer, um, uh, and he'll give the answer. The other one that's interesting is, of course, a couple of days later, Theresa May's got uh, a speech lined up where we were thinking we might hear something on uh, what we're finally going to do about the customs union. And Ireland. And Ireland, yeah. Of course, the two things tied together. Tell you what, if history. someone had been saying for the last 19 months that eventually it was all going to come down to Ireland, he, he or she would be unbearably smug at the moment, wouldn't they? Yeah, I don't know anybody like that. Nor do I, thank I don't know. Nobody, nobody could smug like that. Same, yeah. It's coming to 2.12.59, <laughs> that's it for another day. Thank you, Theo Usherwood. We'll do it again tomorrow from 10. The next voice you will hear belongs to Sheila Fogg. You know Tony Blair said it as well, don't you? Yeah, I do know Tony Blair said it as well. <laughs> I said it first. OK. I do miss Tata.